This is the Story Punks podcast, the show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. Today is episode 39, and we'll have 40 as part two of this discussion. This is a book club session, so the Story Punks book club and reading room. You can find that at facebook.com forward slash storypunks. And today we're talking about K.W. Jeter's steampunk classic, Morlock Knight. So I've mentioned it several times that K.W. Jeter is the person who coined the term steampunk, and we're going to talk about the author himself, but I'm speaking with Dr. Mike Pershan, aka the steampunk scholar, who has written a lot of different reviews and all kinds of insights about steampunk and the stories that we tell within this genre. And Mike Bershon has actually written a nonfiction guide called Steampunk FAQ, and I love the subtitle. All that's left to know about the world of goggles, airships, and time travel. So we were also joined by some very helpful private group members over at the Story Punks Facebook group. It is a laboratory, a live recording laboratory. So if you're interested in seeing all of that and being part of that and, you know, adding your comments throughout the session, I would absolutely love that. So you can just ask to join the group. You find the group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash, (laughs) that was hard to say for some reason, forward slash story punks. So yes, I posted that early over there and I just grateful for everyone that is sticking with me through the pitfalls because I do feel like I'm finding them all. So with that, let's launch right into episode 39 and then we'll break and continue in episode 40. This is a two-part show and just as a reminder, there are spoilers because this is considered a book club. Uh, There you go. You're all set and oriented to what to expect. And in addition, I hope you expect to be super inspired because I absolutely was by this insightful discussion with Dr. Mike Pershan. Here we go. Dr. Mike Pershan teaches English full-time at McEwen University, researches steampunk and speculative literature, and giant monsters. He speaks at cons and conferences and draws and writes in his spare time. He is as avid an FRPG player as one can be with kids, a wife, and a yard. And I just want to read some of the reviews on his site. These are some things that people are saying about Mike Pershan, the steampunk scholar. The steampunk scholar is my new blog crush. (laughs) The guy is living my dream. He's doing research on a really awesome topic with cool conferences, the chance to role play and dress up in period clothes, and best of all, having normal people probably find it interesting. That's from Historiographic Anarchy. Louise Curtis says, the steampunk scholar is a brilliant in-depth resource on all things steampunk fiction. The Steampunk Tribune says, For excellent reviews of the growing steampunk literary genre, do make a point to visit, then bookmark, the Steampunk Scholar. Jonathan D. Beer says, The most well-read of all the voices in the steampunk movement, and so on. There are several others. So go check out steampunkscholar.blogspot.com. Welcome. I'm so delighted to have Dr. Mike Pershan on the show with me. And we are talking about K.W. Jeter's work, Morlock Knight. So I am the host of the Story Punks podcast, and we talk about steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. Mike, will you introduce yourself to anyone who isn't familiar with the steampunk scholar? Uh, Hi, I'm Mike Pershan. I teach uh, English at McEwen University in Edmonton, Alberta, in the great white north of Canada. Um, And I've been studying steampunk since 2008. I actually got I I got my PhD in comparative literature, but I often tell people I have a PhD in steampunk because it sounds cool. That sounds super cool. (laughs) So I will be switching between some quotes that we've both submitted And then mostly you'll see us talking, but that will be the difference from last week. So I'm really excited that we got that to work just now. 
thanks to Mike's calming presence. It was very <laughs> helpful. <laughs> More helpful than you know. Okay. Yeah, I, I can't wait to tell my students that my presence is calming to someone. In the- <laughs> it's recorded, so there we this go. Is on it's record. On Official. Yes. So for anyone who didn't join us last week, I'd always do this spoiler alert because basically, even though we'll have some elements of review, you know, we're going to share our opinion about the work, but we're going to assume that you've read the work. So if you are watching this to see if you want to read it, that's fine, but you're going to hear stuff. So just know that Uh, there aren't really any trigger warnings. Uh, that I can think of from this book. It's pretty, no. it's pretty PG. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there, there's, 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 there's a part near the beginning that I had forgotten was is um, for, for, for at the time it was written and for the guy who wrote one of the, like, um, I don't know what, there was a lot of sex and violence in Dr. Adder. Uh, oh, I haven't read it. So, book. and so the fact that he has, that it's a PG book at all. It's like, wow. It's like Tarantino making a cartoon. That's a good description. Even though I haven't, I can't, I guess I can't evaluate the description. I haven't read it or anything, but I feel like I can tell what's in there just from that great description. So as we get started, I want to talk for, you know, 15, 20 minutes. We can always go longer if no one in the audience has a question to submit, but we would love to actually talk about what everyone in the audience wants to talk about. So it's not required. Don't feel any pressure at all. It's not expected. But if you have thought of a question or a topic that you want to share in this forum, in our book club, then will you go ahead and type it out now? That'll help us know and kind of gear towards it. And it's, uh, it just makes it more likely that we'll get to it. But um, again, it's not required. If you think of something along the way, it's not like, this was the end and you can't submit anything after this. So go ahead and jump in with that. And let's start out with world building, Mike, if that's all right with you, Mm. because I felt like the environment for this story really got things started for the characters. There's a lot of books where I feel like it's the other way around, but with this one, as it is an extension of, you know, um, the, the time machine and we're talking about a whole different time and place. And that really takes our character immediately into this other world. So do you have any thoughts along those lines, along the lines of world building? I do, but I'm going to be stealing them from Tim Powers. Do it. Um, he, uh, he, when he, he wrote an introduction to one of the editions for Morlock Knight, and he talked about how um, Jeter had found uh, this stack of massive books at a, I think it was at a flea market. And what he found was Henry Mayhew's London Labor and the London Poor. And this is a terrible Penguin Classics version, which doesn't have half the stuff that they would have been working with. But Jeter was working off of this this documentary uh, series of writings that Mayhew had put together after really going in and observing the London poor and, 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 and where London was at. But what Powers stresses is that the London of, uh, Morlock Knight is Jeter's more, it's Jeter's London. Uh, he says that out of the three of them only, he said he suspected that only Blaylock had ever actually been to London. So the London that they were all creating, those three writers, uh, and Power saying specifically Jeter, he's like, that's all, that's Jeter London. He made, he's made all this up and no matter, it, it maybe it feels real. Uh, maybe it just feels, you know, maybe to someone who is from London, they're like, this is crap. Um, but he, he said it, 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 at least within the pages of the book feels like a real space. And, and I echo that. I, I feel like there is, there, it definitely has this sense of, of, you know, imagining the streets um, and the darkness and, um, and, and I have more to say about that, but that's about as much as I want to say at this point. Okay, that's fair. Yes. And if anyone listens to the audiobook, that's actually how I read this through my ears. And it includes that Tim Powers intro Mm. to the book. And it was so fascinating. So I highly recommend checking that intro out in its entirety. It's really, really cool. Yeah, I loved that this was such a weird extension of the time machine. So there are many different versions. Many authors have have extended that story. But this one, the fact that he 
went Arthurian with it was super weird and super cool to me. And I really wasn't expecting that from this book. You know, I've heard about Morlock Knight over and over because K.W. Jeter did coin the term steampunk for anyone that doesn't know. But that was very surprising to me. And I, I just didn't know that was part of it. So, so I'm curious, Cindy, I want to know because... I, I've had conversations with people who they, there's this reputation around this book. So I'm curious what your expectation was. Well, my expectation was that it was going to be pretty grim. I don't know. I think it was, it was because of just gleaning things from panels and I can't really yeah. say specifically, but my basic understanding going into the book was that this going, was going to be pretty heavy, that it was yeah. going to, and nothing could be further from the truth. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's fairly whimsical. I had a, I had a conversation. I don't remember how long ago with another steampunk scholar. Her name's Helena Esser. And um, she messaged me going, okay, I'm reading uh, Morlock Knight, and I want to know when the heck it gets serious and gritty and political. And I'm like, never does. And he's like, but everybody thinks it does. Why does everybody keep saying it does? And I'm like, because I, I don't actually know why. I suspect it's because it's like with the difference engine, there's lots of people who own it and very few people who've read it. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the funny thing to me about this book ever since I read it. And I remember when I bought it, it was, it was really tough to track down. It was before the um, Angry Robot edition had come out. And so I had to pay more than I paid for just about any other book. When I was building my steampunk library to do my PhD, uh, Morlock Knight cost me like, it was 25 bucks for this tiny little uh, paperback. And, but I'm really glad I got this one. I was going to say, I love that cover actually. Yeah. Well, I love it too, because it, the artist is Josh Kirby and Kirby was responsible for the really busy, chaotic covers of Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels oh. before handed over to Paul Kidby. And Josh Kirby can, he can put a ton of stuff onto a cover and still make it feel like it's, it's, it's going on. And w when I read Morlock Knight and, and I think about all those Pratchett covers, I'm like, I don't think this was his best cover ever, but he certainly was the right artist for it. I mean, you pick up any Terry Pratchett novel that um, that Kirby was responsible for doing the art for, and you have the right feel for how much cr crazy stuff goes on in Morlock Knight. It, it certainly fits the description of Gonzo that <laughs> got woven into that original definition for steampunk. That's so cool. Okay, so anyone who hasn't heard this gonzo term, can you elaborate? Is there much to elaborate on with that? Or is it? I don't know. It could just be like 80s Californian slang. Oh, it's um, just a descriptor. Okay. Yeah, it's absolutely just a descriptor. And um, something to know about something to know about Jeter, Blaylock, and Powers is they're all they they all love to laugh. They all love to, they love to land a joke. And so to throw a descriptor like Gonzo in there is just, it's, it's normal conversation for, for them. Okay. That totally makes sense. Thank you for kind of explaining that because I cannot remember the gentleman who wrote the, at the end of the audiobook. there is basically a description of KW Jeter's work and it was really good. I'll post it when I post this as a podcast. Story punks. I'm adding this after the fact. The commentator was Adam Roberts, 2011. But but he used that word gonzo as well. And so I was just wondering where that came from. There, so this is at the end of the audiobook. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I got to check that out. I w I'd be interested to, to see what somebody would be saying about that. I find that um, in discussions about really early steampunk, uh, people do this 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 retro engineering where they take whatever they think steampunk is today and they go it had to have been that back then um and and they and so they they just assume and i mean and all sorts of people are doing this this isn't just like joe on the internet is doing this um where is it here i don't know if i'll find it but there is a, here it is um steaming into a victorian future this is an academic uh collection um and julia uh julie antideo and cynthia j miller in their introduction um called uh james bloody locks homunculus this really dark and gritty story and i'm like i don't think we were reading the same novel yeah 
So a lot of it comes down to this interpretation, perhaps, of the word steampunk. So you gave me a couple quotes about the term mm-hmm. steampunk. Would this yeah. be a good time to share those? Sure, let's do that. I feel like I need like a chime or something because this is that exciting that I figured out. Hopefully. Oh, like on uh, like the old storybook records. Yeah, exactly. This is by K.W. Jeter. My coining back in 1987 of the word steampunk originally might have been more of a humorous jab at a tendency going around those days of labeling any two genre writers with more in common than bipedal locomotion as the <laughs> quote, insert word here, dash punk, unquote movement. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense for the audio listeners. There was some punctuation in there. But I know yeah. this is something we've talked a lot about on the podcast is definition. So um, yes, what did this insight for you? Uh, it was just uh, finding out that it was a joke was was very liberating for me in my work because I had like um, I had been involved in some conversations early on um, where I was just sort of I, I initially thought as a scholar I better listen to these people they know and then I realized that in a lot of cases it was it was an awful lot like when I was doing academic work and re- religious studies never ask the religious adherent what their religion is observe it from a distance look at their texts observe what they're doing in their rituals don't ask them because you ask them my precise definition of this is what i experience and there was so much sort of solipsistic um subjective uh i am steampunk therefore steampunk is what i am going on in 2008 2009 and to find out that Jeter had been making fun of, like, cyberpunk was the big punk of the 80s. But we also had splatterpunk, and I believe ribofunk was kicking around in there somewhere. And and I couldn't help but think of the old Billy Joel song, you know, like, it's still rock and roll to me. Like, no matter which ones we throw in here, and I even feel that way today with some of the other terms um, that we use in the specialized discussion of these sort of retro punk that's why i love the title of your podcast by the way i need to say that i think story punk is such a great way to just go look we're going to put this in in under this umbrella and then we're going to have a conversation about it um but finding out that he was he wasn't serious about it helped me to be able to say i'm not going to take this as seriously as y'all are um because you get these conversations uh where somebody would say you know, we're going to put the punk back in steampunk as though it had always been there when, as it turned out, it was there in Moorcock, but it wasn't there in, in Jeter, you know? Yes, because I was really interested in this timeline. Jeter wrote Morlock Knight in 1979. Mm-hmm. And then we had 1983, 1984, when we had Bruce Bethke coined the term cyberpunk And also, um, you know, we had other cyberpunk works starting to come out. And then it was later in the 80s when we had Jeter name steampunk in that letter. So it's interesting because this work we're talking about today predates cyberpunk. And yet we often say that steampunk is a cyberpunk derivative. So some of it's probably up to interpretation. (laughs) I mean, you know. That that, that, that is one of... The, to me, it's like a tripping point for people. If they think that steampunk has this relationship, this very strong relationship with cyberpunk, I think they're going to be frequently disappointed by works like Morlock Knight. Um, Even uh, Jeter's later steampunk, Infernal Devices, is not any more... Uh, tied to cyberpunk. And I think the reason that that's such a common idea is not only the the two words side by side, but also uh, the difference engine being written by William Gibson and and that being the novel that really put steampunk on the map. I mean, the all these other books were very niche. And I mean, if you knew Michael Moorcock, you knew Elric. If you knew Tim Powers, you knew him for a million other things, but probably not Anubis Gates. Um, if you knew James Blaylock, nobody knew James Blaylock. That's the thing. James, I mean, we did. I remember seeing James Blaylock's fantasy stuff on the shelves. I never saw any of Jeter's work except for Dr. Adder. That's the only thing I remember. I grew up in a small uh, city. And when I say small city, I have to caveat that for <laughs> Americans. 
because what it means is it's a town for America. Um, in Canada, we're, we're allowed to call them cities at that point. <laughs> That's fair. So, and, and, and so it, whatever was on our bookshelf was what was really popular. And, and, and so that you just sort of think about people perceiving what is steampunk through the lens of the difference engine. I think that's, that's mostly where that comes from. Oh, that's so good. Now we have a couple quotes that deal with definitions and such. Sure. Would you be interested in me including the onion or the Nivens right now? Let's not do the Nevins one. Let's do, but let's do the Onion one because I think I think that sort of riffs off of what I was just uh, talking about. Okay, great. With, with the way that people sort of throw this backwards. Okay, so I'll read this. Rebecca Onion says, "Many of the people who participate in the subculture see reading, constructing, and writing about steam technology as a highly liberatory countercultural practice. Hence, the addition of the word punk." So you can see what she's doing there, right? She says most of the people, and she's writing about steampunk in the the aughts, in you know, two thousand five up to two thousand. 10 or 11, probably. I don't remember exactly when Onion wrote that article, but um, she's saying many of the people who participate in the subculture, and even just knowing that we're talking about the steampunk subculture, that didn't exist when Jeter was doing his thing uh, in the 80s. See, reading, constructing, and writing about steam technology as a highly liberatory countercultural practice. If ever there was an academic phrase <laughs> or punk, there it is right there. Highly liberatory countercultural practice. I love it, but it's just I do how. Too. It's typical of how we roll. Um, and then she says, hence the addition of the word punk. And I'm like, no, no, no. Well, that's what I thought when I read the quote. I really liked the, her contribution. But yeah. I thought, I don't know that it was added in that way. No, not at all. And he's he's gone on the record a couple of times. I mean, I, he was the guest of honor at the one of the last steam cons that I got to attend in Seattle. And he flat out said, you guys are all incredible. <laughs> And you weren't what I had in mind, right? Like he, 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 he readily admits he was just making a joke and he never thought it would turn into anything as big as all this. He was always a little bit bemused by it. I felt. Well, you'd have to be, if you're thinking about that perspective. Yeah. At first I thought, well, it's kind of like a Frankenstein story, but I don't think he was even trying to build a Frankenstein. I think he was just no. chatting, you yes. know? He, he gets he gets a he gets an, a letter from the people at Locus and the, and the offices for Locus are located just down the road from where he would have been living in those days and so these are people that you've got in your community more or less and and from my and I, mean, I have very limited experiences of going down and being where when these guys are at uh, conventions and, and conferences and such but it's it, there's always a sense of like there's a gang of people getting together who know each other really well so you imagine somebody from locust going hey kw what what's going on with these gonzo victorian fantasies that you and blaylock and powers are writing and he goes ha steampunk right and makes a joke and and a few years later william gibson and bruce sterling do the difference engine and I mean, William Gibson's serious, right? And academics love William Gibson. So all of that, I think it's rolled into this ball of like, then it must be this, you know, liberatory countercultural stuff. It couldn't, it couldn't just be a joke. It couldn't just be for funsies. I, but at the same time, that's not me saying that I don't think that, like, I, I think it's totally legitimate for people in the 21st century to have appropriated the term and said, you know what we'd like to do. And I, I this is just, I, I wish they'd stop saying, let's put the punk back in steampunk. Just say you're putting the punk in it. That'll be fine. You know, and we'll be like, yay, because language changes over time. And if people appropriate a term, especially one that's been made up and do something with it, that's new, then, and, and, it, and if it goes on with that, you know, which it has. Obviously, it has. Or we wouldn't both have had these experiences where we went and read Morlock Knight and went, "What? Yeah, yeah." And so. there's something very meta about it. You know, it's mm -hmm. punk, so it's not going to stay in the boundaries anybody put it in, right? Well, yeah, and that's actually it was. It was funny as I was working on this article about 
those three writers and, and, and Moorcock and this whole idea of putting punk back into steampunk. And if anybody cares, this is the book that got published and it's called Like Clockwork. Um, and it was uh, edited by Rachel Bowser and Brian Croxall. And so this is one of the, you know, when you write articles as a, as a scholar, sometimes you're really proud of them and sometimes you wish you hadn't published them. And this one I'm really proud of. But as I rolled into the conclusion, it occurred to me, why does anyone who self-identifies as punk in any way, shape or form give two hoots about appealing to origins? Because that's what we're doing whenever we go like, ooh, well, Moorcock did it back in the day or ooh, Jeter did it back in the day. We're appealing to origins. Punks don't appeal to origins. They give you the finger and they, you know, go and do whatever they want. Well, and maybe they do appeal to origins, but they don't necessarily adhere it like they may know the origin and then they exactly. want they want to know it so that they can subvert yeah. it which is exactly insane, but exactly yeah, yeah totally okay so story punks let's break here and meet back up with episode 40 but i do know one thing you could do on your little break here and that is to review the Story Punks podcast. So if you go to iTunes or any of the other environments you might be listening to us on, you know, Stitcher, or there's so many, I won't even list them all, but um, you can find a place to review it. It's going to be different for every platform and every device you're on. So the big thing with iTunes is you just need to be signed into your iTunes account, and then you should be able to scroll down and find where to leave a review. But if you do have trouble with that, just know that I do offer guidance on that. Just sign up for my newsletter and I actually walk you through it all. And then you're also connected to me by email. So that would be really fun. And you can find the newsletter at storypunks.world forward slash newsletter. I look forward to continuing the conversation as you have time to listen to it in episode 40. If not, have a wonderful day until you can join us again.